Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Welcome as much as it drives Fuzzy Butts all over this place. Absolutely crazy when they hear me say it. I am the host of this show, your big dog. And look over there to my left who's joined us again for this episode. It's Ginger Morgan. She's my co-host. She's also the co-producer of this show. And she's also the director, executive director of the Puppy Up Foundation. Ginger, how are you this week? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I have to, I have to, I, it seems like I'm apologizing every week for technical difficulties and all these things but as you know my laptop just died and i could get no charge on it and it's been a painful like five weeks and we we tried to do it with an apple um notebook or uh, imac and and it didn't look good didn't sound good and it was hame and so thank goodness uh monday i got my laptop back if you can see me now i've got the camera on i look good uh, well, at least I hope it looked look better than before. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a bit of a stretch, uh, but I, I apologize. We should be back on schedule, everyone. This is going to be dropping a day late, but I've ha we've had to cancel and reschedule so many podcasts as a result of technical difficulties. So again, I apologize to my audience, uh, but we are still up and going, and uh, we've got a lot more in store uh, coming up. We've got uh, Ginger, we've got Craig Clifford coming back on the show, and we're excited because he wants to talk specifically about a new cancer drug. So we've got a lot of exciting things coming up. But I'm also and excited. And the Madison Walk is on uh, May 5th in yeah, yeah. Madison, Wisconsin, they on Cinco de Mayo. So if you're listening and you're going to be there, dress up. You know, I'm in San Antonio now, and I, I'm 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 going to be in the Pooch Parade. By the way, if you're in San Antonio, Texas, I'm going to be at the Pooch Parade. I'll have a booth. Puppy will have a booth there, and uh, we'll have to be talking about the podcast. And and man, I imagine they're going to be a, like thousands of dogs that are all dressed up in the Cinco de Mayo and uh, uh, Muertos Dilos Dilos Muertos. Uh, you know, Day of the Dead sort of attire, and I got to tell you, I I really want to get I want to get Grace in a costume, but I, I'm sorry, I don't. I could go on a lot about that. Uh, if you're in the San Antonio area, come out and check and see us. If you're in Madison, check out the Puppy Up uh, Walk there. And uh, I'm excited, Ginger, to have it's a first. This is a first uh, for us, and uh, I, I I I I think I like to say that I'm complete. I'm a failed. I'm, I just I failed with animal, animal behaviorism and, and and as it pertains to my fuzzy butts and so I'm excited to introduce our, our guest today Ginger. Um, he's uh, done a ton of work on animal behaviorism. He has so many articles uh, that he's published um, and been on multiple podcasts. And uh, we're excited to have Dr. Christopher. Uh, pa pa say, say your last name again. I'm I just Paco pa pa Did I get it? Oh. Cool. cool. I, yeah, I, I, I had it before. Thank you. You corrected me and I just lost it. But it's like Paco Bell's can, can, Canon, that, that famous uh, uh, classical piece. Uh, so Dr. Christopher Paco, my apologies. No worries. No worries. I, uh, I, I'm very much accustomed to my name not sounding at all like the way that it looks when people <laughs> first look at it. So I take no offense whatsoever. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, that still doesn't excuse it. Me screwing that up, Ginger. I put that on my list of things I screwed up on this episode. Oh, but you're sure right. It, it's so okay. misleading. It's P A C H E L, and I thought it was Pichel or something like that. So, what is the origin? Of, I know we're jumping ahead to your origin story, but out of curiosity, while we're talking about, it, what is the origin of your name? Where does it come from? It's German. Yeah. So, if you if you think about it truly, with that kind of glottal Paco sort of a glottal stop in the middle and then just refine it a little bit versus Pachel would be going more sort of French, French or something. Right. Yeah. So think of it as German and then you'll be set. Pa Pockel, or I could do Pockel, Pockel, like like the, the, the German guttural uh, thing. Yeah. I actually have uh, German ancestry, an ancestry in me. So, um, all right. Well, we welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends, and uh, thank you for joining us today. We like to start off our show with a little bit of levity and uh, by talking about Fuzzy Butts. So, do you currently have any Fuzzy Butts, uh, Dr. Pockel or uh, Dr. Chris? How about I just call you Dr. Chris so I won't screw <laughs> that up uh, since you go by that. Do you have uh, Fuzzy Butts? I have one in my household right now. I've got a Bull Terrier, Rat Terrier mixed breed dog who is... He just celebrated his 11th birthday earlier this month. So he's in that phase of life where we're watching a little bit more carefully, perhaps, than we did five to six years ago. But he's he's doing great. Uh, you would you would never know other than the uh, 
the gray uh, starting to come in around the face a bit, you would never know that he's uh, hit 11 already. His name is Cornelius, also known as Corndog or Cornholio or uh, any number of, um, in fact, when my, when my husband gets a little bit angry or upset or ugh, frustrated, uh, it's the only time that Cornelius ever gets uh, referred to as Neil. So uh, again, all of the names apply. Cornelius is the official name. Did Cornelius, Cornelius uh, a inspired from history or is it inspired from Fight Club? I think that was the fake name that Ed Norton used. <laughs> yeah, actually, not neither. Neither of neither. those. Um, we were actually driving uh, just west of Portland here. So I'm in Portland, Oregon, and we were coming back from the coast. And there's a location as you come across the mountain range, the coastal range between the coast and Portland, uh, Cornelius Pass is one of the, the locations you go through. And so we thought, gosh, you know, that's you know, kind of a cool name. We, at some point, we'll have a dog named Cornelius, and we, we spell it with a Z at the end rather than an S just to have a little pop of flair in there, because why not? Uh, and so we were sort of waiting for this dog who would show up with a big enough personality that he could be Cornelius with a Z. And lo and behold, um, a bull terrier pup really fits that bill quite nicely. <laughs> It wow. does. It does. And that he's a mix between a bull terrier and a rat terrier. I bet he's a handsome kid as well. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you, you you know much about me, but I walked the entire length of the West Coast from Canada to Mexico. And we walked right through Portland over the bridge. I can't recall the name of the bridge, but it was just absolutely exquisite, exquisite having the mountain ranges on the left side of me. We walked from north to south and then you had the Pacific Ocean. So what a beautiful part of of the world you live in i so now I, I i now i get it why you live out there because it really is an animal loving uh, community out there very much so i i was actually coming out to portland uh, for the first time when i was doing my residency training as a veterinary behaviorist uh, so starting out with my dbm working in small animal general practice and then switched back into to behavior as a specialty and during my residency, while I was running a house call practice in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, I was working with a mentor who was out in Portland at the time. And so I was coming out three or four times a year for a week or so at a time and had an opportunity to, to experience Portland all year round at little, little small uh, swatches of time. And by the time I was finishing up my residency, I was basically in love with Portland and we ended up relocating because it's it's just that magical as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and it, it's 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 really some very similar to New England, except minus the 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 Arctic winters there. But I gotta tell you, you have such a, a, a beautiful array of flora on the, the West Coast, particularly in Oregon, that you just don't see. In, in the rest of the country. So uh, for our, our, my, our audience members that haven't been out to the Portland area uh, or all along the West Coast, uh, you know, really is worth it getting on Route 1, Route 101, which is what we did. We, did, we weren't on the Pacific Coast Trail. We did, that, we did the Pacific Coast Highway and it was brutal. Um, I, still, I still think my, I have nightmares um, from all the times we almost got killed there. But uh, uh, so let's, so you sp spoke briefly about your, your past being you are a veterinarian, DVM. Uh, tell us your origin story. So how did you get from, where did you start and how did you get from there to where you are now? So my origin started, uh, I'm, I'm originally from northern Minnesota, so very small town, about 1,100 people up on the Canadian border. And so, you know, I'm grateful to say that I've got a, a lot of experience in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different communities and a lot of different regions. And so, you know, knowing what it looks like to grow up in a relatively rural community, very, very small town, very community and family oriented. Uh, I did my undergraduate education uh, in Moorhead, Minnesota, at a place called Concordia College, with a background in both the sciences as a, as my pre vet but then also with an undergraduate minor in music performance, which has served me well over the years. Uh, and then on to, to veterinary school at the University of Minnesota. And then from there went into general practice. And I, I often uh, say now, sort of looking back on my career, I got into veterinary medicine because I love animals, but I got into behavior because I love people. And it was my clients and their struggle uh, trying to navigate some of the difficult scenarios that were going on in their lives and within their households and within their pets that they didn't have an understanding or an explanation or a solution for that got me into that sort of curious mindset of saying, hey, how can I learn a bit more? 
And once I started digging even just a little bit in that industry, man, I was hooked. And basically, uh, I remember coming back from a from an intensive education experience, sharing with my then uh, significant other, now husband, that I so you know basically said, I don't know what's going to happen next, but I think this is the beginning of the end of my general practice career. It's going to be something to do with behavior. Let's see where this where this happens. And so yeah, I went back into residency, did my specialty training while I was a business owner in the Minneapolis St. Paul area doing exclusively house calls. So I was in and out of thousands of people's homes during that time period, really getting a feel for how people live and how they interact with their dogs and cats and the opportunity then to to transition out into more of an office based practice out here in Portland. And so now I'm the, the owner and lead clinician at the Animal Behavior Clinic, which is a five doctor behavior specialty clinic in Portland. We share a physical location with another business that I'm a co-owner of, and that's Instinct Dog Behavior and Training, uh, which is a, a training group here that's part of a national organization. We've got, mar uh, we've got locations in 11 markets around the U.S., uh, and as a facility here, we have the opportunity to do positive reinforcement board and train services in addition to coaching and day training and homeschool programs, as well as offering a variety of community, edu community education events and free offerings online. So it's uh, it's been a lovely way to really uh, invest back as I continue to, to learn in this industry and in this space. And but it's such a, an important topic uh, and issue because uh, Ginger comes from the shelter rescue world and uh, and 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 it's so tough to to adopt dogs, uh, companion animals out to a family. But then more importantly, you have some of them that doesn't work out. You surrender them, and you also um, you wrote an article about something that I find deeply disturbing, but it's a reality behavioral behavioral euthanism. We'll get to that in a bit. And so helping pet parents, um, uh, helping that relationship, that rapport work is so complicated. It's not easy. And it really comes down to communication and humans don't or can't, or most humans don't know how or can't communicate with their companion animals. It's a big problem. And, uh, and there's a big need for, for what you do. So what have you what have you learned, uh, Dr. Chris, and and, uh, and and since you've been practicing, what have you learned and what kind of overall do you want to share with our audience? Yeah, I think the some of the overarching themes, especially that go along with what you just mentioned, sort of the difficulties uh, within the shelter world, both from the perspective of, of potential pet parents, like trying to find that new family member, how do we match those dogs and cats up with appropriate homes, knowing that those animals, while they're in a, a shelter or a foster situation, are often navigating some pretty significant stress themselves. And so the the the, the, vi the vision, the version, the, the visibility of what we see for those animals at that point isn't always what they're going to look like after they get into a home and after they've been there a couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months. So some of the challenges there, I, I think, really come down to teaching people how to read body language and how to interpret it correctly so that they can keep their finger on the pulse of what are the things that really create enjoyment for their pets? What are the things that create stress? How does that conversation evolve? Is this a, an animal that's going to benefit from more exercise versus more structure and quieter environments or an animal that really benefits from food-based enrichment and opportunities to use their brain or really what makes them tick, what makes them really click within that family. It's that ability to understand what they're putting out and taking in from the world around them. That for me is, I would say almost across the board is one of the first things that we really need to confirm for our pet parents, that they're understanding the animal in front of them, <clears throat> reading and communicating effectively. Right. And what, one of the things that I've learned, I've backpacked a lot, uh, many, many miles with my dogs. And uh, one of the things I've learned, Dr. Chris, and uh, I know maybe it's a bit controversial or a lot of the PhDs, the academicians out there, they, they don't agree, is the dogs are much more complex intellectually, spiritually, 
emotionally than, than what we we typically I think as a society attribute that attribute to them. And uh, you often read, I've often read some of the academicians out there that have books and have a ton of a, a, a large corpus of research out there, as they liken dogs in particular to four-year-old children. And I, I, I got to tell you, I just, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I think that the, the rate limiting step in the equation is our inability that we don't have the means to measure their intelligence or, or, or we don't understand it and they can't communicate to us or we're not understanding that. What are your thoughts on, on that? I think to, you know, to, to a large degree, I think you're right. I mean, there's, there's a, a bit of anthropocentrism that sort of factors in there, right? The only viewpoint that I can really view a dog through is through the lens of a primate, of a human. I'm going to see things through my perspective because I don't actually know what it's like to, to, to move in a dog's body or to smell what they're able to take in or to understand the differences between their visual capacity. And, and that's even before we get to some of the cognitive changes or differences that we may be seeing there. And, you know, to what degree do they experience complex emotions, for example? What degree do they actually think about those complex emotions as opposed to just feeling them in the moment? How, you know, how much ability do they have to move forward and backwards in time? You know, and sort of, again, with the, the, the more complex abstract thought processes. I don't know that we can fully understand those details. Uh, I think that when we're looking at making a comparison over to the human progression of what we have the capacity to do, I think a lot of the research that supports that, you know, preschool age cognitive ability is, is pretty accurate. But I also don't think that it's the full picture, right? Especially when we're looking at a mature animal, a five, six, seven year old dog who has a lot of life experience and the benefit of actually getting to, you know, a five year old dog is developmentally more like the equivalent of like a 35 to 45 year old person, right? On their developmental trajectory. And so we're gonna see a more complex development of emotional states and cognitive abilities even though they're quote unquote only five or six years old, but how do we measure that? Because it's, again, it's, it's, it's just different. It's just different. So I, I think there's, there's accuracy and incompleteness in that comparison. That's, that's a very well said, very well spoken. And I'm probably going to amend my, my thinking is that in that respect, in that regard, um, one of the things that you write about, and I think it's so important in this equation, and it's, it's a challenge for pet parents out there is, is, is enriching the lives of your companion animals. And I think whether you're on a backpacking adventure or whatever way you, do, you, you're, you're able to do that in your, your companion animal, however they wanna do that, I think that's so important on many respects. You, also, you, you enrich their lives, but you also gain a deeper, fuller understanding of them and their, and their psychology, their behaviorisms. Um, so speak to us about how pet parents can, can, can enrich can better enrich the lives of, of and, and their relationships with their companion animals. Yeah, it's a really important detail. And I think this is especially true for any of the animals that are living in environments that are really not what they were suited to live in, right? So if we think about sort of a, a wild canid and the the opportunity to, to be able to, to have a lot of free choice and agency and the ability to explore and kind of fend for themselves to some degree. Now, there's a huge difference between our domestic dogs now and those wild canids. There's a lot of developmental changes, so I'm not in any way trying to say that we're talking apples to apples in this comparison, but we do have that need for exploring and using your brain and using your nose and moving your body and so the further removed we get from that the more potential there is to be some conflict and sort of a mismatch between the animal's needs and the environment that they're living in and so when we think about the role of enrichment i think sometimes it gets sort of oversimplified as well let's make sure they're having fun and, and that's part of it, sure. Of course, we want them to be enjoying themselves and, and, and having fun and, and, and us enjoying our company and, and the companionship that, that they bring. But it's so much more than that. It's actually what are the ways that we can meet the needs of the animal in front of you, knowing that the needs of an eight-year-old Newfoundland, for example, are going to be very different from a year and a half old Vishla, for example. You know, so it's not just dogs need this. It's more about who are you 
and really troubleshooting. Uh, and this is something that we spend a lot of time with, with the dogs who are staying with us in the facility. Then when we're working with our pet parents to say, let's try some stuff. So let's spend a couple of days doing scent games, you know, finding treats that have been hidden or playing scent based games. And then ask the question, did that seem like it moved the kind of the need of your pet's overall satisfaction and their comfort and did it move it in a positive direction or did we think we actually saw some frustration and a need for something different so now let's try doing more physical activity and let's see how that looks and really trying to get a sense of which of those activities and and outings and environments how do they actually meet the needs of that animal knowing that it's not just environmental but even thinking about you know some of our dogs who are social butterflies then they can go to a farmer's market on a Saturday and, you know, leave at the end of the day and just breathe a deep, big sigh and say, oh, my God, that was the best day in the world compared to other dogs where they're there for five minutes and, and we have to get them out of there. It's just it's too much. It's too intense. They don't have the coping skills for that. So I think when it comes to enrichment, I, I think the two takeaways are that it's more than just fun time and it's so individual and that we have to really look at who that animal is and what are their needs and, and are we equipped to be able to meet those needs in the environment we're asking them to live in? Yeah, I've read, I've, I've, I read first about the concept of enrichments as it pertained to zoos and how they, they had much, much better outcomes in terms of fertility, in terms of life, uh, longevity. Um, if they enrich their environments, and as you're speaking, it's not making it's not fun time. It's rather than feeding them, dumping a, a pile of uh, fish for uh, sea otter or something like that, uh, make them make them work for it, right? Feed, I know with polar bears, they free, some zoos they freeze the fish, and so they have to work at it. And some bears, they actually have them climb trees. They hide. They hide. It's almost like the gamification. Um, in a certain sense, but their challenges, and you're right, it speaks to their instinctive uh, evolutionary nature, and that's the challenge. You used a word I think is so important. We hear about it a lot nowadays, and that is agency, right? And and some people are coming up with some really crazy ideas with agency, but fundamentally, as as a, I'm not a, a naturalist or believing in nature, nature wins all the arguments, right? You, you, we can think whatever, but at the, at the end of the day, nature wins, right? How it designed us, how it tooled us, what it meant for us. It, it 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 wins in the end. So um, it's not no animal, re regardless of size, shape, or species or classification, is meant to be under something else's domain. It's not uh, subjugated to someone else's control. And with dogs and companion animals, it's tough. But the trade off, of course, is you take care of them. Right? They get care. They live longer. And they they in turn have a, a fuller, rich life, more enriched life. But I gotta tell you, I'm on my I'm on my fifth Pyrenees, and agency is always a funny issue with me because I, they I, I don't call them great Pyrenees, I call them ungrateful Pyrenees, or at least mine, because they just they look at me sometimes when I tell them what to do, or at least ask them what to do, and they look at me like I don't really need you. I have I've been around since three thousand BC, my friend. And I've been taking care of myself. We've been taking care of ourselves. So if you could just, you know, provide us with some food on a regular basis and then let us go roam about, then that would be great. But uh, then, of course, you do that. And then you have societal issues such as, you know, uh, Pyrenees roaming, roaming, roaming amok and society is never a good thing. So agency is a complicated uh, issue. Um, one of the things that you talk about also that I find very fascinating, and I don't know if those dub dovetails up appropriately, but you but there's something that you you call instinct dog training, and as you said, you have a secondary business uh, with that. So please t tell me, I would love to learn what that means and what it involves. Yeah, so Instinct is a company that was originally founded in 2008 uh, by colleagues of mine, Brian Burton and Sarah Frazier. Uh, they developed a, a model for delivering dog training services, uh, primarily out of their East Harlem, New York location. And it has since blossomed into uh, a presence in 11 different markets around the U.S., uh, we're, I would say we're international as well in that our founders live in the eastern side of Canada and some of our client services team are in Nova Scotia. So we kind of straddle that North American border here a bit. Um, but the, the thing that really connected me to, to Instinct, not only is the opportunity to have a, a greater reach within the dog training community, but also our philosophy, which is really founded on what we refer to as nature-driven nurture. 
And it's a concept of seeing that animal in front of you, not just saying, oh, you're a dog, so therefore I know what you need, or you're a German shepherd, so therefore I'm going to have you, you know, come sit down, stay in place and kind of program you to do all of the things like a robot. It's really looking at the dog in front of you and saying, who are you? How old are you? What are your needs? What are your individual temperament quali you know, qualities? And, and how can we best meet those? And how can we collaboratively move toward uh, a partnership, a level of communication and, and, and a back and forth understanding that is not us putting ourselves on top of you and are us saying, well, I am the human and so therefore I will program you in all of those ways. And no, no, not at all. With that being said, we can absolutely create high level, precise, precision you know, skills and, and functional coping skills. So we train anywhere from sort of new puppies getting a start in the world, all the way up to complex behavior issues where we're really trying to unpack some of those fear, anxiety, and stress, uh, emotional states, and some of the potentially dangerous or problematic coping strategies that animals may develop if they don't have an appropriate education or an appropriate translation to what it really looks like to, to live in the world that we've created for them. So the entire approach of instinct that, that comes through not only in our one-on-one -on -one sessions that we do with our clients, but a lot of our free resources that we've put out to the, to the community as well, is really coming back to that. Who are you? Who are we? How do we engage the conversation? How do we utilize science-based education, an understanding of reinforcement-based principles, and if and as we need to use certain types of, of management or tools, how do we train you so that we're actually helping again that dialogue so that a leash isn't aversive? Or if I'm using a head collar or a front clip harness, I'm not using that to suppress or punish your behavior, but rather to create that as a communication tool. So all of those things are, are you know, some of the reasons why I've connected with Instinct and why I'm absolutely proud to be a member of this particular community in, in the dog training and behavior space. But yeah, you, you said it correctly. Absolutely. It's a partnership. And it's one of the things I learned on the road is that um, I look to uh, my my fuzzy butts, my Pyrenees that were walking with me. I've walked some 4,250 miles with dogs. And so, um, well, 250 of those miles, I pushed this. I pushed him in an electric cart. My three-legged dog couldn't do it. So I had to push him up and down the, the, the Adirondacks, the mountains in uh, New York State. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, when when uh, we, we met so many adversities on the road, we had so many challenges. And that's why backpacking is is one of those great, I think, one of those great activities that if, if you get off the trail, on the trail, you have so many challenges that 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 confront you on the road. And I there were times where I had no idea and I was unsure. My I didn't have any confidence. I didn't know what decision I needed to make. And they felt that through the leash. They felt, well, whether they felt that through the leash, they just knew it. We had a, yeah. we, I, I think we had the perfect partnership on the road because I would lean into them and look to them, especially at night, to let me know what was going on and what was, what, what were risks or dangers uh, were near us. And during the day, they kind of looked to me. But I tell you, every time that I had zero confidence, I tried to walk and they're like, no, oh, wait, maybe we should think about this, whether it was crossing a dangerous bridge. Um, or whatever. There's in a couple instances, instances I could not get um, Hudson and Murphy to cross that bridge in Baltimore, uh, and we had to call a taxi just to take us over the bridge because they were like, "Oh, it's just too dangerous, Poppy. This is way too dangerous." But the challenge really is humans listening to to yes. li opening yourself up and trying to listen. We live in a noisy, noisy, noisy world. And and I, I I do this. I'm the worst dog dad in the universe. Ginger could attest to that. I, I it, some people might think I'm great, but in, in so many ways I am great because I'm loyal and I'll, I'll fight for to, for them to the end and give them the best care. But in so many ways I'm not because I I, I subject myself. I'm. It's so easy to be distracted by the noise and to stop and listen. So what do you recommend for pet parents out there? At what when when you're working in your clinic with pet parents to improve that rapport? What do you recommend, how, how do you recommend for them to listen, to do a better job of listening? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a skill level that, you know, comes really naturally to some people, and it's a really steep uphill climb for others. 
And, and so, you know, one of the first things that we try to do is really meet the people where they are, trying to understand their perspective. You know, someone who comes into dog ownership as my dad did, for example, growing up on a functional family farm that they needed in order to sustain life for them in northern Minnesota, his perspective on what an animal that belongs to the family, what that animal is going to do and provide looks very different from someone who, you know, lives in, you know, downtown Chicago, and they've got a, you know, a, a Pomeranian who wouldn't last seven minutes in an actual wild environment, right? Those, those perspectives, I'm not saying either of those is inherently better or worse, but they're just different. And so first things first, before I can jump in and try to coach that owner or that pet parent on, here's what you need to know, I have to lean in with curiosity first and say, tell me about your relationship. What do you see? You know, you know your dog better than I do. Even if you don't exactly know the words to put to it, you know them intuitively better than I do. So how can I figure out where you're starting from? And together we can create a pathway forward to either put words to your observations or if you're seeing something, but maybe you've got an, a slightly skewed perception of what that means, Let's define that together. I know dogs, I know behavior, I know animals, but you know this one. So how do we meet collaboratively, you and I, to empower you to really understand? And there's a lot of fact checking that goes back and forth. Tell me your observations. Tell me what you're seeing. Let me help you to understand what that means. And then let's try some stuff. Okay, X, Y, and Z, let's do this. And then let's, you know, recap and, and, and reevaluate in a week or two weeks or two months, whatever the time period needs to be, and see whether or not we shifted things in the positive direction. So it it's collaborative between myself and the clients and between the clients and the animals that they're working with. And the moment I go into it with that same, you know, we were talking earlier, I'm not just going to walk in and program their dog or, or somebody who wants to just come in and you know, use a remote control to program their dog, that's not going to work for, in my opinion, for their relationship with their animal any more than it would for me to walk in and think that I'm just going to tell the client what they need to know. I have to walk in with curiosity, figure out where they're starting from, how can I benefit them, and what, truthfully, do I have to learn from them in the process? The moment my ego gets in the way of that, I'm, I'm less effective. So got to be able to step aside. So you really are an animal behaviorist and include in the animal category humans as well. So you have to understand, again, the psychology, um, the background, the history of the companion animal that you're working with and also the pet parent, most often who's an idiot. I, 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 I shouldn't condemn other pet parents like I do myself because there are- some don't, don't, call, don't call all pet parents idiots just because you may lean in that direction. <laughs> All right, I'm the only one. That, you're right. I'm the only one in that category. Well, I but I, but for me, I do that because it, it provides me with a degree of humility. I, I my default is I'm always wrong, Ginger. It's like I'm not understanding. There's something that I'm not understanding, and, and so I do that not to be self-deprecating, not to be insulting, or I just I, I do that because it puts me in the right mentality to open myself up to learn. There's a mistake I'm making somewhere, and I have to stop and 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 get rid of the noise. And just focus on on this particular um, issue. And so, can I, can I give you a word please. redirect on that, Luke? Absolutely. Can Can I try something for you? Sure. So, when you talk about that idiot label, at least the way that lands for my brains, I think it, might, it landed on my brain the same way it did for Ginger, where you know either self deprecating or it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, dial it back. I love using the word naive. Yeah. Specifically from the standpoint of. I just don't know what I don't know. So in this context, I can look at myself as being really naive about a lot of things in the world. And that's where I find a lot of my pet parents are. They're well-intentioned. They absolutely are trying to do the best they can with the tools they have available and the knowledge they have available in that moment. But they've got gaps in their knowledge base. So that naive label for me better captures that without potentially leaning in the uh, potentially insulting direction or dragging people under the bus with me if I'm self-deprecating. So I don't know how that lands for you, but it's, no, it's I, something that I've adopted in my career. I'm, I'm, I like naive. I like naive. naive. <laughs> it's great. It's a proper term. It's a very academic term. I understand its meaning. and But but me alone in my house, I'm calling myself an idiot. So I didn't mean to presume anybody else should join me in the category. <laughs> 
Um, it, it, I, I, it's only myself because I do think that that it is that it is important. So, but but I've also learned what's what's important. At, at, at I've been around the block too, uh, many 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 times, and uh, communication uh, inter interspecies is communicating interspecies is tough, but even communicating within your own species is very difficult. And so I want to ask you, and this is kind of the um, uh, out of the blue uh, question I didn't put on the uh, talking points that I sent to you, is how do you feel like there's, so, there, and so let me set it up, there are so many variables, we've talked about some of them, in this complex uh, relationship equation, right? So many variables, um, the dogs, you know, your companion animal's history, their psychology, and their breed, there's mm -hmm. All these things, and then when you add humans, that becomes a much more complex equation. So, do you feel like, and is there any work being done um, in trying to use AI to to better analyze and better assess all these um, multiple, many complex variables to get a better outcome? Is AI playing a role now in animal behaviorism? Uh, I think AI, I think we're in many ways, we're very much, especially kind of at the practical level, I think we're very much in its infancy in terms of understanding what it can and can't do. Um, you know, I think we're at a point right now where especially if we're looking at some of the resources that are available, um, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I use AI within my daily practice. Um, I use one of the services that allows me to record my consultations and it paraphrases that back to me in a form of my medical records. And so it's really creating some amazing efficiencies. The limitation there is it's paraphrasing and capturing the nuance of what I'm putting out there. So presuming that I know what I'm talking about, the AI component of that can generate a product that's helpful <clears throat> and useful and efficient. I truthfully have no doubt that at some point that collective knowledge will allow us to tap into it. I think one of the big challenges, as, as you know, um, as, as I, I think we're all hopefully pretty comfortable admitting, you know, if you Google stuff, you're gonna find the right answer and a whole lot of wrong ones. And until we get to a point where AI can really assess the validity of all the information point outs there, I think we have to be really cautious about just how much trust we put in that. It may give us a really good average or an interpretation of what's going on there. But there's that critical thought piece that, I don't know, I I haven't seen enough yet to suggest that it's that well, think, capable of, of replicating that. I think you're spot on. Um, it, it all comes down to how whatever you what data you input into AI determines the outcome or output you get. And yes. as you know, garbage in, garbage out. And that's so a whole lot of work needs to be done. But I'm excited about the future. We, we've had uh, many um, of our guests talk about AI in veterinary medicine on the cancer research side. So um, that's a little bit different than, than your area of expertise. Your, your area of expertise is, is much more complex. And, and I, I would say from a qualitative, not a quantitative standpoint, and that's the degree of difficulty. Um, as, as a segue to that, and I have a comedy bit about this. I, I try to do stand-up comedy, and my all my humor is about or uh, are, are, is about animals. That's all I talk about since they preoccupy all my waking hours. Ginger, I I try to make fun and have fun with it. But I have a question, and I think about this a lot. I think about the downside. What about in terms of technologies? What about Neuralink and its its promise of one day in the future? Who knows when? creating some type of communication interface between you and your dog. Um, do you, do, how would that, do, do you think, A, that's feasible um, or that's it, a whole lot of things have to be discovered and understood before that happens? And then how will that change your dog? Because you, you probably would become like a dog therapist where I bring my fuzzy butt in, we'd sit on your couch and you'd ask us what's going on. I'm like, well, I, we used to be getting along perfectly until he started talking. And now he just won't stop talking. So what are your thoughts about Neuralink and, and the possibilities there? I, I think I, I'm, uh, what's the right word? Uh, skeptical. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, I, I look at the the way in which I have the ability to interact with, you know, with dogs or cats or horses or parrots or whatever the species is that I'm, that I'm working with at the time. And I, I guess I get a bit not only skeptical, but also a little <laughs> bit critical in that if you pay attention to the information they're already giving us through their lens, through their communication, 
we have the ability to communicate so much better than most of us actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when I think about something like you're describing, again, it's back to that anthropocentric view. How do I take what you bring, your sort of imperfect perfection, and what you bring into the world, and I translate it into something I understand, versus me actually seeking to try to understand what you're putting out there. I see, I see the, the, the drive, the value of it, but I think it in some ways oversimplifies the brilliant nuance that already is. And I would personally rather lean into understanding who they are as individuals in the way that they interface with the world rather than creating a translator, so to speak, that is, it, it, this is my bias, at least in my lifetime, I don't see it actually doing that in a way that actually adds anything more than what I have the capacity to do right now. You know, I think sometimes if you're just listening, I had a, a little uh, dog and a friend was over and my dog was outside and she said, and the dog started barking. She said, what is she barking about? I said, oh, there's um, somebody walking by. And so my friend looks out the window and she goes, yeah. And then the dog, she was there for a little bit. And then somebody, um, the dog started barking again. And she said, well, what is she barking about now? I said, I listened for a second. I said, oh, there's somebody walking by with a dog. And the, you know, my friend looked out the window and she says, yeah. And then my dog just went berserk. And she goes, what happened? I said, the dog just jumped in the yard. <laughs> my friend looked out the window, the dog was in the yard. She said, how did you know all that? I said, it's all in the tone of the bark. <laughs> that That is true. I, you, you can definitely, there's tonality issues. And and I have uh, my Pyrenees, my my fourth fuzzy butt, uh, Indiana, he's a geriatric patient. He's got peripheral neuropathy. And and I and he whines all the time because he can't get up without unassisted, and so um, he has to. I have to get help him get up to get water, to get food, to urinate, to take care of his business. And and there's a there's all I can discern now. I become an expert because every two hours I hear him whining, and I can discern the level of urgency, and I can and I can discern what what the issue is. Does he just want some water? But but you're right. It's it's listening and um, it's experiencing it and opening yourself up to it. But it's also a lot of work, and I think that is what what technologies like Neur Neuralink. It's like getting the answers to the test, right? They, they want to circumvent the actual work, but relationships require work. It, and 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 the other thing I want to point out real quickly, and I'm sure you agree with this, me, but I want to move on. We have so many other things to talk about. Um, is that commu our communication? Human communication is very very fallible. Um, it, it, our spoken language, it, it's such an impediment to conceptualizing, I think, and truly communicating in and of itself. So one thing I do hope that Neuralink or whatever technology like it or something that takes its place or whatever the case is, is that maybe we don't seek to communicate with other species, interspecies in our language, but we find some, some common form of conceptualization that at least enables us to have some basic basic language. Um, and uh, so I'm excited about it. But yes, is that it should never replace the work that, that's required in building a relationship, because that's the beauty of it. Next thing I want to get to, to, and I want to talk about this, this is one of the tough ones. Um, and then I want to get to something that's a little bit funnier and loftier, is that uh, you, you write about behavioral euthanasia. euthanasia and and I'm, I'm guessing in the sense of you have uh, I, I know this. We all know this. We have pet parents out there or uh, shelters or rescues. Ginger, you could speak to this. You have more experience than I do. Uh, you have dogs that just they have way too much trauma. They 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 things bad things have happened to them. Uh, uh, darn it. Uh, in some horrible circumstance with some really bad people. And 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 they act out in a way that's dangerous um, from a societal standpoint. Um, what is your work? Uh, and so I'm assuming you try to minimize um, people that have to make the the, the, the tough, hard, sad, tragic decision to euthanize a dog um, or a companion animal of any sort uh, because of behavioral behavioral issues. What are you finding, Dr. Chris, out there? And what what advice can you provide to pet parents that have a tough kid, to have a tough fuzzy butt? It's hard, and they're they're wits in. You know, the, every day it's like I don't know what I'm doing wrong. What do you? What do you what what would you have to say to them to say please don't do that it, it exhaust all resources before you do that what what what's your advice? 
So it, it's a complex topic, as you've alluded to. And I think, you know, I always go back to the fundamental, even the, the like the derivation of the word euthanasia means good death. That's actually what it means. So there's a, there's a variety of different types of euthanasia. And when we're talking about the behavioral euthanasia piece, it most likely comes into the conversation either when we're talking about an animal who's displaying behavioral characteristics that are unsafe to others, or in some cases unsafe to themselves, or there's a level of emotional distress that from a quality of life standpoint, we may be contemplating that if we don't have a way of alleviating that suffering that may be coming from emotional distress. And so, you know, in, in any of these cases, you know, the, the first thing first, as we've been talking about with regard to communication and what does the animal need and doing the best we can with the limits we have in whatever circumstance we're operating within to try to meet those needs, to maintain safety, to maintain quality of life. And there are times that even when we can identify what that animal's needs might be, we don't always have that at our disposal. Whether it's a limit of time, financial resources, maybe it's a specific environmental need that that animal has that we just, under the limits of what we're operating within, we just do not have the ability to meet in that moment. And so part of it is, is you know, understanding as best we can what uh, an intervention might look like and assessing to what degree is that available to us. And, you know, my, my job as a veterinary behaviorist is not to tell a client or a pet parent or a shelter staff member or a veterinarian. It's not my job to tell them what they should do. My job is to help them understand what are the options? What are the potential outcomes based on each of these decisions? And at least in the environment where animals are considered property under our care, what are the options that exist for them? Well, you know, ideally, hopefully, really maintaining the integrity of that human animal bond and the emotional connection that we have and, and, and to, honestly, a level of stewardship that we have to care for and provide for them and to never make that decision lightly but also recognizing that in some cases, if there is a level of safety or quality of life based on self-injury or emotional distress or panic disorder or you know, all of these issues that, that we see within the practice, there are circumstances where making a decision to humanely end the life of that animal is under those circumstances the best option. And I, I always I always try to choose my words so carefully because I never want anyone to to hear those words and think that, you know, that my ego is getting in there to say, oh, I know what's best. No, most of the time I actually have no idea, but I can identify to the best of our ability, what do we think the next steps might be and are those accessible to us? And if we don't have options, we don't have options. And if there's an, uh, a level of safety or quality of life that exists by moving forward, sometimes that's just not an available option. So there's, there's, there's a lot of nuance within that conversation that I'm happy to get into, but those are some of the thoughts that come to mind initially. It's a complex issue. And, and I, I, to me, uh, I am critical. I'm critical of everything uh, myself, most importantly. And I, I, I just, I want to make sure that to pet parent exhausts all resources, all available options but before that decision is made, because you're making that decision on behalf of another another life, and that's just a it's just a bad decision. I've had to make it three times. It was all cancer, and there was just no quality of life left. But um, unfortunately, knock on wood, I've never had to deal uh, with the behavioral issues um, that deep. But I, I I I spent some time up at Eddie's Wheels up in Northern Mass, and I got to tell you a funny story. There was a Chihuahua there, a little big guy. And they found him in Puerto Rico and he had no no legs, just like the stumps for, for back legs, hind legs. And he was in a grocery bag and somebody had just discarded the guy. And so he was rescued and they, they got him up to Eddie's wheels and Eddie's wheels outfitted him with some wheels and he was all set. Um, and so uh, he I, when I went up to their, their office, um, he was amongst uh, a whole bunch of tiny dogs, micro dogs that all had these like like um, match wheels, all these evil Knievel, uh, evil Knievel wheels. And it was really cool to see. But however, this one little chihuahua, 
he was the angriest and most hateful dog. He was he would get so angry whenever he, somebody would come into the office, he would attack his own tires. And you look at his tires and they were all chewed up and stuff. So you would think it's like, wow, you got rescued. You were in these horrible conditions. You got rescued and you think you'd be a nice little chihuahua with this brand new set of wheels, but you're not. And so it, it, it's such a it's such an important issue that some animals, companion animals, they just don't get over the trauma. They just don't get over the issues. But but I loved it that Eddie's wheels, he got rescued and he found a place where he could take out all of his aggression on his wheels and, and still find a place in society. So I, I look at it from that that framework is that just please, if you have a, a companion animal with serious behavioral disorders, just meet with a, a animal behaviors such as yourself and then explore all possibilities. And that would include rehoming them, finding a good environment, a, a, an environment that's better suited for them. Right. With, with some limitations there, Luke, and I think this is one of the things where, again, when we really get into the decision making capability, exhausting all options has caveats all options that exist for you, knowing that accessibility of care, even having the time in some cases to explore those options, if there's an imminent safety risk, it sometimes is necessary to make those decisions knowing, and this is something I, I'm not trying to quote unquote, let anybody off the hook here by saying, oh, it's the easy out. I, but I also wanna give people some grace that if they're doing the best they can with the limitations that they are navigating in their own life, there may be times where they know that there are additional options, but they're not accessible in that moment. And really being mindful of that and understanding that, and also recognizing that in some cases, when we look at the interface between behavioral patterns like aggression or other issues, uh, some of the other mental or emotional disorders that we see, there can be underlying, underlying physical issues that we can't correct whether that's something like a brain tumor or other hormonal or endocrine disorders that may not have treatment associated with them, that even if we're investing in them, there may actually not be solutions for them. And I also want to be mindful too, and that, you know, we talk a lot about sort of the trauma impact and that the way that that manifests in behavior change, you know, even insufficient socialization or early life exposure predisposes the brain to see novelty or unknown circumstances as potential threats. And so it's not always the case of trauma or individuals doing things. Sometimes it's really the life circumstances that we just do not have a way to reprogram what was off the rails from the beginning in terms of their socialization and early life experiences. So all of those caveats, if anybody's listening to this and who's saying, yeah, I'm really, really stuck, by all means, explore to the limits of what you have the ability to do and tap into community resources. And there's organizations like the Facebook group Losing Lulu, for example, that are great resources for really being able to tap into behavioral euthanasia as a topic. Love, love, love really exploring that. And it's tough. And uh, if you're navigating that out there, it's 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 tough. We see you. It is. I was facing making that decision with one of my own dogs, uh, Luke Honey. When she was like, she was the perfect puppy, no behavior issues, nothing. She turned 18 months old and it was like the day late, the day after that, her behavior, she started being uh, pushy and aggressive to my a little older male dog. Then she started with the smaller dogs, you know, you just had to be really careful. And there was, you know, I was, I was doing my best and at that moment for what I knew. And then, um, I, you know, I was right down to making that decision and I had a, a trainer come and he said something and I don't remember what it's, what he said that just triggered something in my mind. It was like open the whole world as to what it was. And I think it was something about she was, and it was me that she was resource guarding, not like her bones or her toys or whatever it was that it was me. And I guess I, I think that's what it was. And I hadn't put those, that two and two together. So after that, I was very cognizant of when, she, when other dogs were around me, where she was. And in my environment, I could control her environment. Yes. If I wasn't able to control her environment, then I would have had to have euthanized her. Even my vet was like, Ginger, if, if she had a different owner, or pet parent, 
um, I think he did say owner, it was a while back, um, she would be unruly. But I had a conversation. I had a relationship with her where I could look at her and literally if I wanted her to move right, I would look, you know, my, I would move my eyes right and she would just do that. But I trained with her. I did all kinds of stuff with her, fun things with her to make her, to me, I mean, I don't know, you can tell me, but to make her feel important to me so that when she wasn't with me, she didn't have to be so anxious about not being with me and that I didn't love her. But I may be just putting some human stuff to find human feelings to my dog. So, and I do that a lot. <laughs> there, there are so many things I want to talk to you about, Dr. Chris. Uh, you, you, you're right about canine PTSD, which, PTSD, which is, is such an important topic. Um, cat stress, I know less about that, but I know, uh, I would imagine there's some pretty wigged out cats out there. Um, and, uh, and also I wanted to talk to you about medicating, uh, medication, um, benzodiazepines or, or whatever as a way to, to, to help that. I, we've had some people on our show that felt like dogs were under being under medicated, that they need more medication, but I still feel like that's a shortcut. But what I want to get to, um, I think as, as, as uh, what I, what I think is kind of a, a funny, interesting thing is you wrote an article about, um, how to, how to help dogs with their humping. And I know it's a common uh, common problem, and it's it's personal to me because my fuzzy butt number three Hudson, God bless him, he lived to 15 years old, and he humped from the day he was born till the day he died. He was humping. His nickname was Humpin' Hudson. And uh, there's a famous story about him being on the Poughkeepsie Bridge, pedestrian bridge. We were doing a memorial ceremony, and while everyone was bowing their head in silence, there was a blind golden retriever that he just went over and started humping. But the interesting thing about Hudson was he it wasn't aggressive. It was never a, an alpha male. He was the exact opposite of an alpha male. He just thought it was funny or he would just smile and it wasn't aggressive at all. So um, any, I'm throwing out those topics. If anyone you want to discuss with us briefly, I know you have a tight schedule uh, today and, uh, but there's so many other things I want to talk to you and explore with you, but what are your, what are you, what, what what's your advice? Because I know there are pet, pet parents out there that have humping dogs. What are your, what's your advice about that? So the, the the short answer on that one is the vast majority of the time, if we look at sort of all the dogs out there who engage in that humping or mounting behavior, the vast majority of the time, it is coming from a place of, I'm going to use the word arousal. And I'm not talking about sexual arousal. I'm not talking about dominance or any of that sort of stuff. It's really an animal who is amped who is activated and who doesn't have a way to dissipate that energy in a more appropriate way. And so in some ways, if we think about that stress response, almost in that sort of fight, flight, freeze, fidget sort of, you know, mindset, and it's way more complex than that. But in this case, uh, mounting is often sort of a displacement activity or something that's sort of an outlet for that arousal as an opportunity to, to put it somewhere. Um, it often gets misinterpreted as either a sexual behavior, which of course it can be under certain circumstances, um, or it gets misinterpreted as an alpha type behavior, which it can be, but that's way, 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 way down on the list. It's more often when we start to look at that particular behavior, and this is sort of broadening the scope just a little bit, anytime we have a behavior of concern, it's often really helpful to say, okay, what is the behavior? Let me describe exactly what it is that I'm focused on and then decide, okay, under what conditions, what are the antecedent conditions under which that occurs? And then we can look at some consequences as well as a way of what might, what the reinforcement or motivation might be for that particular behavior. But the reason I'm bringing it into this conversation is that when we start talking about mounting or, or humping behavior, and, and we often say, okay, oh gosh, it happens, you know, all the time or every single time, when we really start to tease it out, it may be happening, let's say at the dog park during a meet and greet. And it's often a dog who has some other little insecurities about how to meet and greet another dog appropriately. So it may be a manifestation of anxiety or insecurity in that context, or maybe it's the dog that somebody walks through the front door and the dog rushes up and, you know, goes to town on their leg, for example, and it's that arousal, it's the excitement, there's a transition that's happening and the dog doesn't have the coping skills, either the lack of training or lack of experience to know what to do or how to behave under those conditions. And so it's often something that when we teach that animal, hey, when somebody walks through the front door, do this instead, 
we don't have to resort to corrective training methods. We resort to educational methods to actually teach them what it is that we want them to do when we build coping strategies. When we do that, the mounting behavior in many cases, I would argue the majority sort of disappears because it really, it wasn't the problem per se, it was the manifestation or the visible expression of that. But the issue was an animal who had big feelings and didn't have the skills to navigate it. If we address that, then we see resolution or at least significant improvement in those patterns. Boy, I like that term, displacement activity. That's that's very true. It's, it, it really is illuminating to me. And I, I, I just learned a lot from everything you just said, but this displacement activities that applies to humans as well. And uh, one thing's for sure, like what you're speaking, is that you, you, the, the better, I always had this funny saying is that um, uh, a a well behaved dog is dog or person or animal f fill in the blank is a, is a well exercised or well challenged uh, animal and I and that certainly seems like what you're saying it holds it holds true is that figure out what the antecedent behavior is address that and then exercise them or challenge them that way. Um, all right, Dr. Chris, I know you're pressed for time today. Thank you so much. Is there anything that we left off the table? I I, I have so much notes here. I take copious notes and write down everything I left. I know I had things I, I'll defer. Hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again. Um, did, did, I, did we leave anything um, off the table you wanted to discuss? I've um, got about 432 other topics that are on my brain this morning, but no, in the time that we have available today, no, I think it's it's a good, uh, good look at a lot of different areas. And, you know, I think just the, the overarching theme that I, I kind of connects to so much of what we talked about today is leaning in with curiosity leaning in with empathy as best we can, try to see what that world or that perspective might look like, whether it's another person that we're trying to intersect with or the dog or the cat or the other animal. While I can't put myself fully in their shoes, I can empathize to sort of feel alongside of them to try to gain a better understanding of what they may be navigating. And I can explore that with that curiosity to say, hey, is there something else that we could do? And then evaluate whether or not that shifted things in a positive or negative direction and we can refine our our our, our um, interventions or even just our understanding of one another and i think that's kind of the big piece here is you know if i'm thinking about quote unquote dog training to me it's it's empathy before education and education before correction that if we come into that from the standpoint of curiosity and really seeking first to understand before we just plow forward with our agenda there's so much that we have the potential to learn and so much good that we can co-create within the world that if we're locked in our own view and our own little microcosm and trying to convince everybody and everything around us that our way is the right way, man, we miss so many layers of nuance and so much incredibleness in the world around us. So leaning in with curiosity and, and yeah. I can I could go on and on with all I, of that. I love I love that. Empathy, I, no, I love this. Perfectly stated. Empathy before education, education before correction, and and that's just a life lesson. Not only in, in all relationships, that's just a life lesson that I I seem to, to to have missed out. Well, Dr. Chris, where can people, where can our audience find you and learn more about the the the, the, the all the wonderful uh, articles you've published and and other podcasts. Um, always go to Fuzzy Butts and Friends first. Uh, we're we're the number one resource for all things Fuzzy Butt. But where where can people find you? The easiest place to find me is on drpockel.com. So d r p a c h e l dot com. From that main landing page, you can either go to the media tab and find out of the traditional podcasts and webinars and recordings and articles. Uh, you can also find information there about instinct, dog behavior, and training. You can find more information about Animal Behavior Clinic and the practice that we have here in Portland, uh, as well as other projects, including something called Lima Beings, which you'll have to check that out. It's linked from the site there as well, really about applying some of these principles that we think about with dog and animal training to what does that actually look like to interface with other people? and to show up with that same empathy and education before correction mindset. How do we bring that into the lives that we live uh, every single day? So all of that's from drpockle.com. And what about social media? 
Yep, you can absolutely find me there as well. Most of my social media content gets put out through either the Animal Behavior Animal Behavior Clinic or through Instinct Dog Behavior and Training, Facebook, Instagram, a little bit of activity on TikTok, but all of those are also linked off of uh, drpockle.com. So you can find me in all of those places. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Pockle. I got it right that time. Uh, so we've reached the time of the show where, Ginger, I asked you if I screwed anything up uh, or what did I do wrong? We know I, I obviously got her guest name wrong at the beginning, even though I, I did practice it, but I just need to practice it a little bit more before we uh, I, I press record. Um, but, uh, and all kidding aside, Ginger, um, what we, we like to, to, to take a little time at this part of the show to do a cancer tip of the week from the puppy up foundation. Ginger, what do you have for us this time? Well, Luke, I'm going to kind of revisit something we have talked about before, but, um, we had pet DX on our podcast a couple of times and they are no longer in business. And that was the blood draw that could tell us about, you know, whether your dog had cancer or not. So it's going to be really important for everybody to learn the warning signs for canine cancer, check their dogs for lumps and bumps, any um, odors, any blood, anything, you know, just go to your veterinarian if you see anything. And I wouldn't wait. And um, when you have the lumps and bumps checked, make sure your veterinarian does a needle aspirate so that they can find out and look at it. And don't take, oh, watch it and see, because I don't know what we're watching to find out. That, yeah. that has always that's always confused me. Why am I watching for it to grow and actually be cancer or is it going to go away? And it, we don't know what's going to happen to it. So just get that fine needle aspirate from your veterinarian. Yeah, since we don't have early diagnostics anymore, unfortunately, um, we'll talk about more, that more. I hope so. And I think so. But uh, you, you having that relationship with your companion animal, that's the main line of, of early diagnostics is, is knowing them. Uh, Ginger, you had one of your your kids that allowed you, Sadler allowed you to clip his toenails, which was atypical behavior. And that just goes to show you, Dr. Chris, that Ginger knew her, her, her mate, Sadler, well enough to know, hey, he doesn't like me doing this normally, so there must be something wrong. And it turned out it was, was cancer. So um, uh, communication on all aspects and having a rapport with, with your companion animal is very, very important. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, before we go, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this episode, Genie's Therapeutics. Uh, my my fuzzy butt number four, Indiana, is on it. He takes it twice every day. And uh, Ginger, I think he hasn't fallen apart 100% because of uh, Genie's Therapeutics. So, so I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful hemp uh, oil-based formulation. You can learn more about it at Genie'sTherapeutics.com. On that note, I'd like to thank Dr. Christopher Pockel uh, for joining us for this episode. And uh, and we'll see. Oh, you can uh, you can listen to this podcast on your platform such as iHeartRadio or Spotify, or you can watch this wonderful. Uh, you got to see Dr. Pockle. He's very uh, emphatic, very passionate. You can see the passion. I love your smile. I would imagine all, all your clients love you. You've got that. You've got a wonderful energy about you, Dr. Pockle. Yes. All right, everybody. So you can watch this live or watch it on our YouTube channel, fuzzybuttstudios.com. Until next time, puppy up. Talk soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.